from Kansas State University. This is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson with you. Coming up today, during his weekly grain market segment, K-State's Dan O'Brien will comment on the market response to China's lifting of the excessive tariff on U.S. grain sorghum and on the implications of persistent dry weather in significant parts of the Corn Belt. Then from the University of Nebraska, Brad Lubin, We'll talk about what's next with the 2018 Farm Bill process in the wake of the House version of that bill being defeated last week. He'll remark on the notable differences between the House and Senate Farm Bill proposals that are still anticipated and the prospects for compromise. And checking in later with the latest on Kansas agricultural weather, K-State's Mary Knapp, along with more here on Agriculture Today. Hamburgers, roast, ribs, steak, or whatever you prefer. Beef, it's what's for dinner. Kansas cattle farmers produce 7.5 million head of cattle per year. It takes about 7 tablespoons of peanut butter to get the same amount of protein in one serving of lean beef. Support your local Kansas farmers and ranchers. Eat beef. This message was brought to you by the K-State Animal Sciences Leadership Academy participants. Once again, thanks for being along with us. This is Agriculture Today from the campus of Kansas State University. It's been a week of, generally speaking now, improved grain prices. And that's our lead theme as we get into the grain market analysis for this week from our guest, Dan O'Brien, grain market economist, K-State Research and Extension from his office in Colby, northwest Kansas. One of the things that was enthusing to the market uh, was something that happened as we were speaking last week, as a matter of fact, Dan, as the news was coming out last Friday morning that the sorghum issues with China were apparently going to be resolved by the Chinese deciding to lift those tariffs. And uh, the interesting thing you point out this week, though, that's not necessarily reflected, that development, in local grain sorghum grain bases here in Kansas. Well, that's true. And also good news came out, if not the same day, just shortly thereafter, regarding soybean, extra tariffs, charges, whatever we want to categorize them as, were lifted for for that crop as well, as well as for other crops. So in in general, although that those agreements aren't finalized and formalized in writing, still, we had sort of a sigh of relief that was breathed by the market. So for us, when we look to see how quickly these export volumes recover and whether we start to see any movement uh, to reflect that in basis levels. Well, it doesn't seem like we've really seen that quite yet. As you mentioned, for grain sorghum, again, we we were watching when those announcements were initially made back towards the end of February. The announcement by the Chinese that they would put these limitations on uh, grain sorghum imports from the U.S. basis immediately changed from about 60, 70 cents over down to about 50, 60 under at our key export locations in the central and eastern part of the state. Mm -hmm. And as you look at basis levels yesterday on May the 24th, we still see some pretty wide basis levels, not quite as wide as they had been when they got down to 60 cents under or even worse. They're still at 50, 55 at some of those key locations, 50, 55, 60, uh, Topeka in particular at, at 55 under July. Uh, Salina running 50 under, Hutchinson are a little narrower at 46, uh, Wellington at 47 under. So some places starting to show a little bit of improvement perhaps, but still not a, not a gangbusters return to U.S. grain sorghum export business quite yet. The issue is that the door is open, mm-hmm. and as buyers start to probably come to the place down the road where they'll need more supplies to fill gaps, that they anticipate, then we would hope that those those numbers would come back. So we'll be watching for that. And and really, when we look at the pace of exports for grain sorghum, again, grain sorghum has typically followed a, a kind of a feast or famine uh, actual shipments mode on a week-to-week basis. So this week happened to be a down week. That was more of a decent week last week. So I, I think the issue to watch will be what happens over the course of the next month or so, and, and uh, hopefully for the sake of, of grain sorghum sellers here in the U.S. and exporters, that there'll be some more movement. Corn movement in the last week actually is pretty positive. As you would mentioned earlier on here, Eric, we've seen some price improvement 
I've heard these various crops uh, from a week ago when we talked. Uh, we've seen corn futures move up about about a dime, nine to ten cents. Uh, soybean futures about forty cents, and wheat about thirty or so cents. So we've seen some positive movement in these markets in the last week. And when you look at the export movement, some of that corn again with shipments of about fifty-eight million bushels during the week ending. Uh, May the 17th, and with, with the need for about 54, 55 million bushels of shipments to meet the USDA's projections, well, that's a pretty good pace. We have seen for soybeans also a little bit of a pickup in export shipments for the week ending May, May 17th. Again, about 33 million bushels. We need about 26 to meet the USDA's projection. Again, still dealing with a lot of supplies of soybeans coming out of, of Brazil some uh, capable market analysts have come in, made some statements to the effect that, yes, Brazil has a large crop and there's still a competitor with us in the world market, but the shortfall that we've seen now in Argentina does tend to tighten up the world market. And really maybe our time, our time here in the U.S. for exports will be when, when they get on the tail end of those a little bit tighter than usual South American supplies in total. And when they get to the tail end of their availability, then you wonder where U.S. soybean exports will really go off to. So we'll, we'll see. Uh, probably better times ahead with that. And, uh, of course, we've been really strong, downright bullish in terms of soybean meal exports. Mm-hmm. And, again, the number one meal exporter in the world has been Argentina, and they're short this year. So we've seen quite a bit of, uh, of meal uh, exports and crush here in the U.S. I have to ask you, as per the Corn Belt and the weather patterns, Although this could change quickly, and uh, once again, we've seen planting progress uh, soar in that region in the last two or three weeks, there still are some pockets of dry weather and, in fact, drought present there. And uh, at what point might that become something of a market factor? Well, so far, dry conditions have led to uh, pretty decent planting weather. But we're trying to look over the hill (laughs) to to anticipate (laughs) how the depletion of soil moisture will will affect us as this crop develops. As you look at the percent of normal rainfall over the last 90 days at first and then over the last 30 days here in the U.S., there's uh, some pretty depleted areas right through Illinois, Indiana, off into eastern Ohio, also uh, southern Iowa, and uh, particularly as you head up into Minnesota, northern Wisconsin, parts of South Dakota, North Dakota. So we anticipate that, of course, we get rain and, and, and major concerns we have right now will all be done away with, et cetera. But we're betting on future weather patterns bringing that rain in. And until that actually happens, uh, you've got predicted soil moisture anomalies for the next, well, from the 24th to the 31st of May, getting fairly extreme through, a, again, a good chunk of these main states, as we talked about, but particularly in northern Missouri, southern Iowa, right through the heart of, of, uh, of Illinois. So, uh, you know, we, we come to these key times of decision in the grain market each year. And right now we're, you know, we're towards the end of May, heading off into June. If the crop is, U.S. crop is going well and there aren't any major issues and rains come well, the market isn't far from assuming that, gosh, we have a big crop coming, we'll just not worry much about what December corn futures might be and where they might move to if, in terms of, uh, of the risk of short crop and then are at risk to seeing that long, slow slide into harvest. Well, here as we said this year, at this time, until or unless those rains come, we're pretty dry in, in basically the, the bread basket, the heart of the U.S. corn belt. And you add that to the supply-demand balance sheet we've got coming into this new crop year, again, that'll start September 1 and Gosh, we whittled uh, our uh, projection of ending stocks for that new crop marketing year down below $2 billion. We're now thinking, well, it's about 16 and a half with lower acres, et cetera. So where we're at this year is a riskier situation than we anticipated. <laughs> As we were thinking about these prospects for the 18-19 marketing year, we're at the, in a situation where if we do – get some type of drought and we don't get what the USDA projected, a full 174 bushels per acre, say we get 170, 168, 165, something like that, given all the corn that we're using, you'd see a strong reaction to the higher side in the corn market. So 
we'll be watching. And so will everybody else. And I, I think that right now we can't sit there and say with with a full, clear conscience that, gosh, we know we're going to have a great crop and uh, prices next harvest, you know, fall of 2018, are going to move down towards, well, below $3, down to, uh, you know, really poor levels. Gosh, that just doesn't seem to be in the cards right now. We've got a, a lot of risk and uncertainty to have to deal with before we can just trust that we'll have a, a large crop and, and low prices out in the fall of 2018. All right. And touching briefly on the wheat trade, producers are eyeing what's going on with prices at their local delivery points and whether we'll see the normal harvest basis uh, as we're not near harvest yet, but within perhaps three weeks or so, we'll see some cutting going on. Basis levels the last one or two weeks at uh, some key locations, again, Colby, Garden City, Salina, Great Bend, uh, they've been improving the last one or two weeks. Now, is that just the pre-harvest move, et cetera. I'm not sure, but but if, if we saw great crops out there and we're anticipating that we were going to see a flood of wheat coming in, I don't know that we see the basis narrowing up right now. So I I think the local basis levels are expressing some of the some of the uncertainty and, and concern we have. Now, still, right during harvest, you would wonder uh, unless we really get out in there and see a major shortfall you'd wonder if we'd see basis levels and prices continue to go higher. Mm-hmm. But immediately coming out of that, out of any harvest glut, uh, right now we're we're looking at a, a pretty short wheat crop in Kansas anyway. Again, wheat tour projected 243. If we get below that, 225 to 200 or something like that, then that's just awfully supportive for the sale of any wheat that we do get. And we'll see where the market and marketing opportunities go about July 1st to July 15th. All right. Our time's away. We'd refer folks again to Dan's notes for the week on the grain markets, which encapsules all of this and much more. That's now posted on the agmanager.info website, as always. And, Dan, enjoy your holiday weekend. Many thanks. Thanks, Eric. Take care. He's our regular Friday guest to talk grain market trends, K-State Research and Extension grain market economist, Dan O'Brien. And you're listening to Agriculture Today. What is radon? Home exposure to radon gas is the leading cause of lung cancer death in the United States for non-smokers. In Kansas, one in four homes will test at or above the EPA action level. The Surgeon General recommends all homes be tested and fixed if necessary. Visit kansasradonprogram.org for more information. Test. Fix. Save a life. This message brought to you by the Kansas Radon Program, the Kansas Association of Broadcasters, and this station. Agriculture Today continues now. Well, just a week ago today, the House of Representatives put forth its vote on its version of the 2018 Farm Bill as it emerged from the House Agriculture Committee. As you well know, hence, that bill was voted into defeat. And what happens from here with that version of the Farm Bill and the whole process in total is our subject on this segment. Once again, joining us from the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, a former K-State agricultural economist and agricultural policy specialist at UNL now, Brad Lubin. And Brad, you might just recap in brief the developments of last Friday and uh, why that bill went down to defeat. Mm -hmm. There are several elements, but one seems to stick out, and that is the association of that bill with immigration legislation. That's right. While the House bill moved through the House Agriculture Committee in fairly straightforward fashion, we knew this House bill was coming up uh, for a four-vote expecting to attract only Republican votes because the, the Democrats stood solidly against it, or at least in in mass were going to vote against it. But then we found out, the House found out, that it didn't have enough Republican votes to pass a bill either, you know, losing 30 votes from Republicans, uh, about half of those votes coming from members of the Freedom Caucus, the uh, right-wing conservative caucus in, in the House that, amongst other things, was pushing for a vote on an immigration bill that wasn't moving forward as well. And the politics and and the uh, brinksmanship uh, apparently said, if we can't find an immigration vote, we can't vote for a farm bill. And they lost 
Republican votes on a farm bill that helped to defeat it. Now, that's about half of the no votes came from presumed members of the Freedom Caucus. There were still half of those no votes that came from other members who had other reasons, perhaps some concerns about overall levels of spending, as well as some concerns about uh, even from Republican representatives, but from states where there are concerns about what changes to SNAP might do to participation and, and benefits in those states. So uh, so there are several issues about how the House bill ended up in defeat and several questions to answer if it's going to move forward. And let's look forward then, because a vote has been scheduled for a second time on this legislation in the latter part of June, correct? Yes, that's correct. Uh, one of those important sort of parliamentary procedures is the Speaker of the House, Paul Ryan, voted against the bill last week so that he could raise a point of order to uh, reconsider the vote. And they immediately filed a motion to reconsider. Uh, after a little bit of consternation, that motion was tabled. Uh, and now we have the details that says they can reconsider the House bill as is, uh, no expectations of changes, but they can reconsider the House bill in a new vote sometime up to June 22nd. Well, presumably that comes with a caveat that says the Freedom Caucus will receive its consideration of an immigration bill in a vote that then presumably would relieve their demands and, and put them in line to help vote for a farm bill in the House uh, here in June. Does parliamentary procedure then, Brad, allow for changes to the farm bill version that was defeated last Friday? Well, anything is possible moving forward with the House version. The procedures that look like they're lining up to reconsider the bill exactly as is. Uh, if that doesn't move forward, then the House really does have to retrench and figure out how to how to rewrite uh, a bill, amending it further, or going back to committee and moving forward a new bill. But the outlook at the moment says the House is trying to push through the same version of the bill in a new vote. Let's say, just for the sake of discussion, that the door is opened to potential changes. What, if anything, do you see as likely discussion points there? Yeah. There are two or three areas where there have been some substantial discussions on the direction of the Farm Bill, uh, all typically towards what elements do the Democrats look for. Because we have to remember, whatever version gets through the House eventually would have to conference with a Senate version mm -hmm. that is likely to not nearly be as right-leaning as what the current House version is. There are concerns and questions about the SNAP program, the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. The House version proposes to rein in some of the eligibility rules and some of the work and training requirements, but to use that money that's saved by reduced participation and reinvesting that in, in job training and educational benefits. So the House version really actually proposes to spend the same amount of money on the nutrition title, but they shove more of it towards training and education as opposed to traditional benefits. That has not been well received by Democrats, as an understatement, I should say. Hmm. And the question of is there any room for compromise in that remains to be seen. Surely there are some Democrats that are acceptable of some level of increased requirements or tightened eligibility, but the overall amount is certainly a question and a challenge for many. There are also some questions on the conservation title, mm -hmm. where the the House version proposes to raise the CRP enrollment cap, but reduce the payment rates and effectively pay for the higher acreage with the same total dollars, and also to combine the stewardship payment components of what is currently the Conservation Stewardship Program into the EQIP program and effectively eliminate the Conservation Stewardship Program going forward. That would mean that we still would have a program that pays both cost share benefits for new practices and a program that pays for stewardship payments or um, incentives to keep doing existing practices but you would lose some of the direction of the CSP program as it currently is, and you would lose some of the total dollars uh, that are projected going forward. Those are two areas where there have been major changes in whether it's House Democrats or whether it's members of the Senate. We really expect those things to look a little bit differently by the time we get all said and done. Mm -hmm. 
As you well know, high on the minds of producers out there, what will happen, if anything, to the federal crop insurance program? There were proposed changes via amendment to the House version, which lost traction before the uh, final vote even came about. Mm -hmm. Is crop insurance going to be, quote, held harmless? Is it off the table for changes? Crop insurance remains a, a critical question. It did face a number of potential amendments and proposals, all of which were defeated at one stage or another or or removed from consideration. So it came through the House version of the Farm Bill intact and remains looking forward as the primary component of the safety net. One does expect additional action on the Senate side, and whether you can hold crop insurance harmless there as well uh, remains to be seen. I would fully expect the Ag Committee to move forward crop insurance as is and maintain that strong support. I would still expect additional fights on the Senate floor, as were proposed originally in the House, to uh, effectively nip at the edges of crop insurance, cutting some of the program elements or reducing the, the subsidy rates and eligibility. Nobody's fundamentally come out and said they're against crop insurance. Mm-hmm. other than a few uh, select uh, interest groups. But everybody's looking at ways to trim the dollars on crop insurance. And so it remains under attack and, and under threat, one of those areas that, that bears close attention. The timeline becomes interesting because if, in fact, a second vote on the House bill comes to pass by June the 22nd, that's the quoted date, in the interim, the Senate might well have finished its version and forwarded it. So there may be some give and take here between the two versions, even during this next three or four week period. Yes, with the delay in the House from a May vote that failed to a presumably rescheduled June vote, instead of the House moving first and producing a product first, now we expect to see Senate action, at least in the Ag Committee, moving a bill forward perhaps the first week of June that will see a very different version Unlike the House that was trying to move a bill on the right side of the aisle, the Senate version knows it has to cross the aisle and move a bill out of the middle. That bill could really serve as an indicator of of the framework for an overall agreement uh, to come later. So the House might take cues from what the Senate comes up with. Yes, the House certainly will, will get cues from what the Senate does. I don't fundamentally think it changes what the House votes on uh, in June that may have to reconsider, but it does set the framework for what an eventual conference committee effort would look like. So it's possible to imagine both the House and the Senate do move bills forward here in June yet, very different looking bills with a very difficult conference to compromise the differences. Will that get done in time to uh, replace the current farm bill by the time it expires in September? Or because of the difficult choices that are due ahead in a conference committee, are we inclined to see it pushed past the election and maybe wrapped up in a lame duck session of Congress late this year? Those are the timing questions ahead. Well, it is a rigorous process that is a long ways from conclusion. That is certain. And in that, Brad, we first appreciate your comments right here and look forward, secondly, to talking with you again as more becomes clear in the weeks ahead concerning the House vote again on its version of the Farm Bill and the Senate Agriculture Committee's proposed bill as well. Appreciate your time as always. Thank you. Thank you. Brad Lubin with us out of the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, where he's an agricultural policy specialist with UNL Extension. We'll be back with more after this. You're tuned to Agriculture Today. While many people know hunger is an issue in developing countries, it is also a problem in our own backyards. In 2010, one in seven Kansans struggled to put adequate food on the table. Two K-State research and extension programs are tackling this problem. The Family Nutrition Program and Expanded Food and Nutrition Education Program reach thousands of Kansans and more than 70 counties. They learn how to eat healthy with a low budget. For more information about these programs, visit ksre.ksu.edu.
Closing out this agriculture today, we talk Kansas agricultural weather and to get the latest from the Weather Data Library here at K-State, alongside Research and Extension climatologist Mary Knapp. First off, Mary, before we get into what's been happening in the weather, do want to let folks know, those who regularly and routinely utilize that fine web service Mesonet out of K-State, all that great weather information that you and your colleagues collect, well... We had technical episodes here on this campus this week, not going into great detail about that, but there have been troubles in restoring web pages, and Mesonet is caught up in that wake, right? Right. Well, our problems are a little bit different than most of them. We've been migrating a lot of our modems behind a firewall to increase security and reduce the chance of them being hacked. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, that firewall is dependent on being identified as a K-State IP address, Mm -hmm. which means when Hale Library's fire occurred and we had all of our difficulties with that, our holes through the firewall, if you were, was blocked. And so we are in the process of trying to get that restored and get those stations back live. We do have about half of our stations that had not been migrated behind the firewall that are still there and still available for that. We aren't losing any data. It's just not as readily available as we would like. And we hope to resolve that shortly, hopefully today. But again, given the intricacies of trying to um, negotiate all of those protocols that it may take a little bit longer to resolve. So that's unfortunate. uh, But again, that's one of our difficulties that you face with modern technology. It's been a furious week for the IT folks on campus to restore those services. But the hope is that very, very soon everything will be back up and in order. So we'll await that. The week in review, well, it was warm. There's no question about that. Right. It was warm, but it was not as warm as we were experiencing in the first two weeks of the month. Statewide temperatures averaged about 67, 68 degrees, which is just a shade over three degrees warmer than normal, in contrast to last week where we were more than nine degrees warmer than normal. So um, it backed off a little bit on the temperature side. One of the big changes from what we were seeing in April has been that our low temperatures have stayed elevated. The range between high and low temperatures was not as strong as we've seen in other time periods. So we're running between a 50-degree difference from high and low to a 34-degree difference between high and low. The, The lowest is down there in that southeast corner where, again, we're seeing those elevated nighttime temperatures and that keeps the range a little bit slower. We did Mm -hmm. hit the 90s, but the high was a 93 on the 19th, and the low was a 42 on the 19th as well in different locations, but again, not the kind of range that we've seen where we've had as much as 90 degree temperature swings. But uh, warmer temps, arbingers of things to come, which we'll talk about, scattered rainfall around the state as well. Yeah, actually, we had some very beneficial rains. The winners in the rain sweepstakes this week were out in the western divisions. All three western divisions were above average for the week. The southwest took the prize at 160% of their normal rainfall. Of course, they don't normally see as much, but they did average 98 hundredths of an inch, which was a surplus of 33 hundredths of an inch. The other area that did see above normal rainfall was the southeast. They averaged 1.88 inches, which was 140% of normal, but a surplus of just over a half an inch. The central divisions didn't fare quite so well, particularly north central and central. They were running 59 hundredths and 56 hundredths of an inch, respectively, which was just over half of what they would typically see in the week. Northeast was also on that low end. We saw an average of six tenths of an inch, which was 60% of normal. So again, we could definitely use more. Mm -hmm. And some places did get it overnight. Which are not accounted for in these numbers, right? Right. These these are only numbers through Tuesday of Mm -hmm. this week. So the recent rains aren't included in that. That'll be in next week's update. And we've 
did have some very prolific rains overnight. We had over 30 stations with more than an inch of rain, and that was scattered through much of the central and east-central divisions. Pomona had the best. They saw 3.12 inches, and that, of course, is in Franklin County. Mm -hmm. In McPherson County, just Southeast of McPherson, they saw an inch and 74 hundredths. Uh, there were some fairly widespread reports of an inch, inch and a half in McPherson County. And indeed, they do have some flood advisories out right now for that county. So rainfall around many parts of Kansas this past week. As we look ahead, there are again those chances for pop-up thunderstorms as the weather remains warm and humid around the state. Right. And they do actually are talking about some extreme heat in particularly the east and southeastern part of the state for the Memorial Day weekend going through the 31st of May. And part of the difficulty with that is, as you noted, the humidity levels are going to be high, so heat index values are also going to be high. That will be of concern for anybody that has confined livestock Mm -hmm. because it's going to be a very brutal weekend as far as the combination of that heat and humidity. And these recent rains will just add to that humidity level. And this pattern is to linger for not only a few days, but the next couple of weeks, you say? Well, the warmer than normal temperatures are expected through the next 6 to 10 and 8 to 14 day outlook. And indeed, the June outlook is for warmer than normal temperatures. The precipitation outlooks are not quite so strong. Our probabilities are not particularly high. And indeed, the precipitation outlook for the 6 to 10 and 8 to 14 day are for drier than normal conditions. In the 6 to 10, it's in the southern tier of counties. As you move into the 8 to 14, it's pretty much statewide. And again, we should note that that does not mean we won't get any rain at all. Mm -hmm. It's just that the accumulative total for that period is not likely to reach what we would normally expect. Mary, enjoy your weekend. Thanks for being along with us. Thanks, Eric. Mary Knapp, climatologist with K-State Research and Extension. Our time is away for today, and we will be away this Monday for the Memorial Day holiday. So please rejoin us on Tuesday, won't you? Until then, do enjoy your weekend as well. Eric Atkinson here for Agriculture Today over the K-State Radio Network.